John in case you don't know. <laughs> Thank you all for, uh, for coming to join us again here tonight. Um, me, we'll do, uh, Bob, if you go to the, the second slide. Let's talk a little bit about what we want to accomplish tonight. So um, we'll have some opening remarks in terms of kind of structurally what we're, we're trying to do. Um, and then we want to give you some updates. So Sharon's going to go through quite a bit of stuff on um, fiscal 14. I'll give you an update on, on some um, stronger than expected results, shall we say. And then our mission tonight is really to be looking forward toward FY16 and even toward FY17. And to talk a little bit about um, how we want to plan. Um, FinCon traditionally gives guidance to uh, all the departments of the town, basically at this meeting, in terms of how to build their budgets for the next year. So that's one of the activities we'll make sure we go through uh, tonight as well. Uh, next slide, if you would. There are a series of public meetings that are scheduled um, by different boards that are going on. So the school committee has their, their list. Um, and January is obviously a very busy time. Uh, the selectmen, January 13th and 20th. We have a placeholder for a financial forum January 28th, which we uh, can talk about. We may want to do that again to kind of have everybody come back and talk about where the guidance and where the plans have taken things, what we want to do from there. February 4th, the school committee votes their budget. And February 13th, uh, the town manager has the budget together, and then it goes over to FinCom for review at that point. Um, FinCom has a series of meetings in February and March to go through them. We try to do it in pieces. We try to have an opportunity for each of the boards, each of the groups, to come up and talk about uh, their plans and what's going on uh, that we look at as well. So just to give kind of a quick overview, and sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this so I don't have to crane my neck looking that way. Um, so where are we, just kind of by, by way of an overview. Um, general economy, in, in the US anyway, um, doing pretty well, low and stable interest rates, modest unemployment, but very little wage growth. The state seems to be hanging in, the revenue seems to be hanging you know, pretty close to the, the budgets that they were expecting. Um, and hopefully there'll be a lot of pressure on giving more aids to cities and towns, you know, regardless of who is, is getting elected next week. Um, the town results to budget, um, as will be presented, were much more favorable than expected this past year. Um, and we'll take a look at that. Um, the net of this is that right now our reserve position actually looks, it was looking strong and it actually looks even stronger. Um, but one of the questions I think we want to talk about is have we tightened down so tightly <coughs> in operating budgets that we're not meeting community needs we had some financial forums, the previous ones, and I'm gonna show the results of that in just a minute, where we talked uh, about a lot of needs that people felt weren't being adequately addressed at this point. So it may be that we wanna be looking at that as well. FinCom has encouraged both the town and the schools and is doing so again right now. <laughs> um, to highlight to the town and to town meeting the priorities that aren't being met with current funding. I think one of the things last year that perhaps didn't happen um, is there were some areas that really needed to be pushed harder that weren't. And that needs to come up through the process in two town meetings so that they can make their decisions. One of the things that we talked about briefly at our last FinCom meeting was the potential for reviewing projects or priorities on kind of a, a merit basis. So there may be some things that aren't getting funded currently, but maybe should be. And that on a merit basis, whether it's in one group or another, that may be something that needs to come up. And that may be uh, it's a different way from what we've done in the past, but that might be the right way. We've had two financial forums, and we talked a little bit about unmet needs as well as revenue enhancement. And if you look at that list of unmet needs, there are quite a few things on there that seem to be priorities, certainly for people who've attended the forums, um, ranging from innovative ideas toward 2020, funding full day kindergarten, athletics, the RISE program, uh, technology, staff retention <coughs> came up quite a bit, senior housing and transportation. There are a number of priorities that, that are listed that people felt aren't being adequately funded. On the revenue enhancement side, and I apologize, I kind of cut and pasted off Excel here so you can see the vote number kind of on the left and then the activity on the right, but there were a number of things that came up. So a number of people talked about overrides, but if you look at other things, encouraging new growth, the CPA, Community Preservation Act, which was brought up, I think Jason Willis brought it up as something that we want to consider. That may be something that, uh, that we need to look at. Um, partnerships, using public land to generate revenue, sale of land, these are the activities that we kind of talked about as, as a group of 30, 40 some odd people that came together at those two meetings. Tonight is kind of the, the culmination of that. So tonight, the goals focus on the review of fiscal 14, establish guidance for, sorry, it's say 16, 17, uh, but establish our guidance going forward for two years. Um, Bob had brought up this idea of a two-year plan, and 
and I think that we've been thinking about it and kind of come to any conclusions. Other than that, it would be great to be able to have a longer planning horizon. And so one of the things I think we're hoping to do is to kind of look, look out at least two years and everything that we're doing in those activities. Um, we've made some key assumptions here, and again, between Sharon and Bob, they'll go through them. But to get to this longer term look, a couple of assumptions we made were, number one, to set reasonable target ranges for um, two somewhat uncontrollable things, healthcare costs and state aid. And the discussion that FinCom had at our last meeting was that um, if we can establish reasonable numbers for those that we would kind of lock in, that we would agree to using free cash to balance any shortfalls from that. So obviously it can't be too low a number, but one of our concerns was that it was too high of a number and it was really restricting all the activity that we could do. The other piece we talked about was taking a look at the capital budget and our plan in the past has been use 5% uh, toward capital and perhaps reducing that slightly, uh, at least in the short term. And we're gonna get into more detail on these, but these are some key assumptions that kind of led to the work. With that, I'll turn it over to Sharon. Please. So I'm going to go over the results of fiscal 14 with you guys first, and then we'll talk about our reserves. And the first slide is the first piece of good news, and that is that our revenues came in $1.8 million over um, our budget. And the um, key pieces that made that up, or the, the, the largest pieces that made that up, were motor vehicle excise, property taxes, and delinquent taxes. And, and you notice there's several items there with asterisks in front of them, and those represent items that um, aren't budgeted for because we don't know about them in advance of the budget process. They're considered one-time payments, and they represent about a million dollars of that $1.8 million, so it's, you know, more than half. <laughs> um, and then I also wanted to make note of the property tax piece. Um, this year, we're going through the audit process, and the auditors are looking at our um, listing of um, abatements that aren't settled at year-end. Um, people have applied for abatements, and they haven't been settled. And the appraiser provides a potential liability for those. And he always is very conservative, so the number at the end of the year was about 685,000. And the auditors are looking at that saying, kind of a material number, maybe we should be recording a liability going forward if this is the kind of liability we could have at your end. So with, if we had done that, you know, we've already had our free cash certified, it's just something that they're throwing out there for potentially for next year. If we had accrued um, for that 685,000, it would have reduced our, re our property tax revenue and set up a liability on our balance sheet. So we would have lost almost, you know, almost $700,000 off of that 1.8. So just, that would have canceled out every overage we had there for property taxes and delinquent taxes. So if that's something that they push for next year, that could affect some of our regeneration. I just wanted to make mention of that. <coughs> so based on the four 14 results, we, um, feel that it might be necessary to make some changes to the fiscal 15 budget because in light of some of that, motor vehicle excise was up 11% over the prior year actual. When we come up with our projections, we're basing them on a five-year average with some consideration of where we are to budget in the current year, and, and, and but we would never probably have gotten to an 11% increase. It really was an amazing increase over the prior year. And motor vehicle excise is one of those taxes that's declining. You pay more for your excise the year you buy your car than you do years later. So it continues to go down until like, <coughs> if you own the car for six years, then it becomes flat and you will never get lower than that. So it's a tax that kind of declines, so it's a very difficult tax for us to really get our arms around what the number is really going to be. So I didn't feel comfortable with going with the 3.35 that we actually collected in um, fiscal 14. Um, but we, are, we were only at $3 million as a projection for fiscal 15. And so at September town meeting, they voted to increase that motor vehicle excise budget by 48,000. And at November town meeting, we're looking to increase it another 100,000. So that brings us up to 3.15 million um, for our budget for fiscal, 14, fiscal 15. And compared to fiscal 14, it seems like that would be a pretty, you know, somewhat conservative, but a pretty good number. For property taxes, there's nothing to do there because all the property taxes are included in the tax base. You can't change them, they're approved by the DOR. Um, and so if we collect more than we make, because basically what we do when we're booking our budget is the tax recap has a total amount of tax levy and then you have the abatement. We book the revenue net of the abatement. So if we abate less, that's how you get more um, revenue than you budgeted because really we're booking the net number. So there's no real change to be done with that property tax that we had for an overage. 
Charges and services was another piece that was a fairly large number of charges and services and permits. But when we compared fiscal 14 actual to what our budget is, it's pretty much in line and didn't feel any need for a revision. So now that we're going through the, um, the tax recap process, the appraiser has gotten approved a, a new growth number. And when we started our budget process, we always um, put a number in there, but we try and be conservative because it's really hard to know that far in advance what the new growth number will be. So we had a $500,000 placeholder in our fiscal 15 budget. As it turns out, we're fortunate again, the number comes in at about 844000 or just under. So at town meeting, we're proposing an increase to that budget line item by 343905 By doing that, we increase our tax base in and it will increase your um, budgets for fiscal 16 because that tax levy is now higher and then you're going 2.5% above that. So th these changes will actually create about 850,000 in the fiscal 16 budget. The other piece of good news is that our expenses came in $1.8 million under budget. Um, and the key um, pieces that make that up are listed here. The biggest pieces are Employee benefits under by three hundred and seven thousand. Um, the um, out of out of district placements, oh, almost six hundred thousand there. Unfilled town positions, three hundred and twenty nine thousand. And then the snow and ice. That's deceiving. We probably asked for more money when we were trying to cover that deficit, not knowing if it was going to continue to snow. It's kind of a hard winter. So that two hundred thousand comes back. So that's basically what makes up those figures there. This is our reserve position. So we've already had our free cash certified at just over $8.5 million. We have um, general, fund sta general stabilization fund of just over $1.5 million. We're planning to use another $280,000 um, at town meeting in November if it gets approved. And then we have FinCom reserves of $150,000, leaving us with just about $10 million or just under $10 million, which is 12% of our net available revenues for fiscal 16. So Mark had asked that I provide a free cash analysis for the last five years and then I look forward for the next few years just to give you an idea of where we stand. And so essentially what I'm showing you here is what we get certified with in the beginning of a fiscal year and then what makes what are those components that make up the regeneration. So that first line there, revenue over budget, that's a key component. If our revenues come in over budget, that contributes to an increase in free cash. Expenses coming in under budget is another component. Then we back out any free cash use that we voted within the year, and then any other adjustments. And the other adjustments would be prior year money brought forward that um, if we brought an encumbrance forward and we closed it for less, that would close to free cash. If we had deficits and grants, um, they get deducted from free cash, so that's what that line is. And that you arrive at your um, certified um, balance at the end of each year. And you'll notice fiscal 11 through fiscal 14, we were increasing free cash at $1 million a year. Um, and so in the last three columns, we, we project out what we would use in free cash or what we think we might use. And assuming a very conservative 750000 revenue over budget, because I think we can pretty safely say we'll probably have that and not doing anything with the expenses under budget, because one would hope we um, budget it that we try to spend it. <laughs> um, so those are the balances that would be if that was you know, the regeneration and, and that's the use. 1.98 is what we currently have as um, fiscal 15 uses of free cash. And then if fiscal 16 and 17, if we use the 1.7 um, that we did in fiscal 15 or to start fiscal 15, where we would be. And the numbers start to decline, um, but that you know that's a very conservative um, look because we are only saying seven hundred and fifty thousand. And if you look at the history, it looks like we've got a million in each year in most cases. <laughs> so, but it is a conservative look. But just to give you an idea where we'd be, um, depending on where we use our free cash. Mark also asked me to just provide some information on the other stabilization funds that we have. Um, the general fund stabilization you saw on the reserve slide is at $1.5 million, but we also have a couple different stabilizations that are earmarked for other purposes. Um, the smart growth stabilization is earmarked for road work and sidewalk work, um, and the sick buyback is 
to um, pay for sick buyback when people retire, that those who are eligible for it. We never seem to be able to keep much money in there. No sooner do we put it in, somebody's retiring, we're taking it out. So it hasn't worked the way they had hoped, um, and that's why there's so little money in there. <laughs> Ooh. That's you. That's me. <laughs> um, we'll spend the next few slides talking about the future, and we'll start with revenue. Time is pretty constrained. We don't invent new products, so it's pretty easy to guess at revenues. Um, the new growth is hard to know, but assuming 500,000, which is a number that's twice as high as what we used to assume about 10 years ago, just for some background. Uh, but it's certainly well below the 800,000 we've had in the last two years. Um, it looks like the property taxes go up a little more than 3% a year, so you get the 2.5% levy plus new growth. Um, it's pretty hard to grow that number much above 3.5%, almost no matter what. Um, there is some optical um, impacts of the library debt exclusion. The actual revenues will go up because there's a, those additional taxes, but they're going to be paying off debt. So I'm just forgetting that both those things offset. So you're looking at a 3% um, or so property tax increase. There's, there's not much to do in local revenues. Uh, the meals tax certainly helped, but it looks like about, again, 3% roughly for the next two years there. Um, State aid, the finance committee uh, at their last meeting has agreed to use a 2.5% assumption for the next two years. And if uh, there's a shortfall there, they'll make it up with free cash. And if it's uh, more than 2.5%, they promise to invite you to the party. And, uh, transfers and available is not usually a very uh, dynamic or exciting number. It's a relatively small number. But we have used up uh, what was planned uh, 10 or 12 years ago from the sale of the landfill. Uh, and, and we've used 50000 a year less for the capital plan from the sale of real estate fund. And that's now empty for that purpose. There's other money in there from recent sales. You know, that'll be a future discussion. Um, and that's why it's negative in the first year. In terms of what the revenue picture looks like when you also think about free cash, uh, again, forgetting about the library debt. We're looking at not quite 3% revenue. We're currently using 1.7 million to balance this year's budget. It might go up higher in the November town meeting. If we use no free cash at all for 16, <coughs> uh, that would drop to a 0.7% increase. And at the last financial forum, I don't remember the number, but I know it was negative. Um, I remember Elaine asking some questions. I think it was negative one and something like positive one. So it's, it's looking a little better for some of the revenue reasons that Sharon um, again, state aid, uh, you know, FinCom has stepped in, so we don't have to worry about that, which I know is very helpful for budget plan. Um, new growth, it's, it's hard to know. We're, we're taking a run at it. Um, certainly the planning staff is extremely busy. Um, and it's certainly worth mentioning, it's, it's come up uh, at the last town meeting and several other public meetings that the Light Department wouldn't mind eliminating the $2.3 million payment they make to the town every year. And that's a very litigious issue, so I'll just leave it at that. But you should be aware it's, it's out there. In terms of what it looks like for the next two years of accommodated costs, <coughs> again, uh, the Finance Committee has stepped in on health insurance and said that um, eight, the first 8% of an increase for each year is on us, if you will, and anything more than 8%, they will take care of it with free cash. So um, I'll be careful what I say, because we are in the middle of negotiations and an RFP, but Generally speaking, um, national health insurance is running uh, 9 to 14 percent or 18, 8 to 14 percent. Um, we're expecting a number that's going to be higher than 8. One never knows. We're out for bid. It might be better. If you look at the uh, net of all of our accommodated costs, they're not so bad. There's been years where they were up 8 to 10 percent, so 4 to 5 percent isn't bad. But remember, the revenue was less than 3, and that's the annual problem. Um, again, here's a schedule on health insurance. Uh, one very helpful piece is that we should know um, our next year's health insurance budget in December this year. We don't usually know until the second week of February, which doesn't really help a lot of us in the budget process. Because we're doing an RFP and negotiating it, I expect we'll have it buttoned up by the middle of December, which again would be very helpful to know. Um, you know, health insurance is, is obviously still a big issue. Um, it's, it's hard for us to know what to do because it's really a national problem. Um, 
the issue, as is explained to our current consultant, is all the tricks and all the levers you used to have to pull with insurance companies don't work anymore because none of them know what's going on. It's such a confusing, muddled industry that you used to be able to say, well, I'll, I'll pay another 50 bucks for the copay for the emergency room visit, and they'd say that's worth a quarter percent of your premiums. No one is quoting it that way anymore. It's just too complicated with federal reform. Uh, energy costs and out-of-district special ed are probably two of the more volatile costs on the school department side. The energy costs that's uh, been provided this year are approximately 5%. There's some that are higher, some that are lower, but that's about what they work out to. We're using four for the next year. Um, what we're told by the light department and certainly the natural gas industry is it's probably going to be higher. So we'll have to see where that goes. Out of district special ed is almost impossible to predict. It's uh, very child specific, um, but the budget is assuming a um, four and a five percent increase in the next two years. If you uh, sort of get to the end of this presentation and start thinking about what to do next, um, and this is just the operating budget as opposed to what you saw before, which is revenues in general and total expenses. This is just the operating budget, and this is the thing that the superintendent and I need to create. If no free cash is used next year, we'll have to cut the operating budgets by six tenths of a percent. And then the second year, if no free cash was used in both years, you get almost a two percent increase. Just to be completely arbitrary, if we use 1.7 million of free cash as we are this year, technically it's a little more than two percent, a little less than uh, two and a half, and a little less than two. I just call it two and a half two. And bear in mind that both of these in the last scenario, income may well be using free cash for those other things they've guaranteed, the state aid and the health insurance. So using 1.7 on this slide may well be more than we're doing currently. And lastly, uh, Mark asked the question, uh, where have we been in the last few years? In the last three years, we've been a little above 3.5% in the operating budgets. It hasn't felt that way. It's always tough. Um, it would take a little over two million and a little over three million of free cash uh, in each of those years. And, and right away, the, the alarm bell that should go off is the second year cost you another million just to keep at that level. And that's going the wrong way. You're not supposed to use more and more. You're supposed to try to wean yourself off. So, you know, fundamentally, we still are faced with a situation where the operating budget is hostage by the fact that accommodated costs go up faster than revenues. It's not any more complicated. And as long as we have uncertainty in health insurance um, and, and the difficulty in health insurance, that fact won't change. And again, it's not a problem created in Reading. It's a problem that the town has aggressively attacked through its unions, and I'll, I'll give them a lot of credit. Um, the 71-29 split is one of the best ones favoring the town that's around. The rate of increase of our premiums over the last five to seven years is the envy of almost every community around us. But that's all in the past. How does it help us going forward? We're at a lower base now than other people because we've done well. We face the same rate of increase that everyone else faces now because the bag of tricks is just about empty. And, and in the nutshell, that's the problem. You're looking at 3% and 5% as the two ballpark numbers. And that 5 is by doing a lot of things we can and trying to contain that. And that's even including uh, something Mark described about capital. Effectively, this equation takes a million dollars you know, more to fix every year. Um, Mark asked a really important question. Are we providing the services required and requested by the community now? Um, I don't normally speak for the superintendent, but I will in this case. Both of our answers is no. I think that's very clear uh, on both sides. Um, we're doing the best we can. Um, it's interesting the fact that, that Mark, and I'm sure he uh, you know, speaks for many people, was not satisfied that we didn't complain enough last year and say, well, they're all the unmet needs. I felt guilty that I did so much of it. Um, it was in the budget documents. It was in the town meeting information. It was a couple pages called unmet needs. But really, unless you stand up and bang the drum or bang someone's head with the drum, it's hard to really get that through to the community. Unfortunately, the only way you get that message through is by doing something drastic and draconian, and none of us want to do that. That's the problem. You know, will revenues increase? Um, 
There's been a lot of discussion at the last FinCon meeting, and I, I promise never to say again that if we spend too much free cash, it'll go down, because it never does. But I'm also kind of afraid I might jinx it if I change. Um, something good it does always happen, and we'll just leave it at that, and I hope it continues. Um, the state is doing very well. It's, it's one of the best uh, economic spots in the nation right now. They're growing at about 5% revenues. They're actually doing well over budget even. And you know what? They're willing to hand out less than 2% in state aid increases because they've got other things to do, just like we do. They have their own accommodated costs, and they have different priorities in state aid. And Mark raised that point. Our three current legislators are keenly aware that we're not real happy about that, but oh well. I don't know what else to say. Uh, it's important. Yeah. Um, you brought casinos. Uh, is there a it's, it's important to know that if the casino vote um, goes through and it's repealed, it likely will reduce the revenue forecast of the state. Not so much in the current year, but in the future years, absolutely. Is there an earmark on that, like there is for lottery aid to no, the counties? There is not. But there will be if it's negative, if it goes away. Um, and I want to just spend a few minutes talking about new growth. Um, the selectmen have an effort with town department heads to really take a look at this, and I think it's great, and I, I do think it'll be very helpful and very interesting. But it's important to keep it in perspective. Uh, 70 million of new development yields a million in property taxes. So if you look at the old Johnson Hardware, for those of you that remember, and the Atlantic Grocery Store, those both being demolished and replaced have added a quarter of a million dollars a year. Those are big changes in the community, and that's not really a whole lot of money. Um, the landfill, as I recall, was about a million dollars a year. That was a huge change. So while new growth is great, um, a lot of it is residential uh, improvements. Uh, the commercial uh, improvements are good. It's not going to get us out of this problem. It, it's going to help at the margin. And um, as, as we've talked uh, with FinCon, aside from an override, there is no one solution to these problems. There is many portions, and this is just one of them. Just to be clear, commercial uh, growth will not solve sort of the, the fundamental structure of deficit that we have in the budget. And FinCom, starting last spring, talked a lot about an override. And you know, the rule of thumb for what that was worth was every 10 years, the past town manager decided to retire without doing one and stuck that with me. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, it's hard to know. Um, the schools in the town have different sort of communities we deal with. I think the schools would say it's a little easier to accomplish an override, and I will tell you it is not. Um, you know, in this building, there's a lot of elderly served. They don't have the money. They can't afford to live in the town the way it is. It's very clear. Um, there may well be some people in this town that would support this and can't afford it, but I can also tell you there's a lot of people that cannot afford it in this town and will not support it. So it's, it's a real tough thing. As Mark mentioned earlier, wage growth generically is very stagnant. So it's not like everyone that lives in town is, is doing very well and can easily do this. Uh, if we do do it, though, it's a huge effort. As many of you know that were involved the last one or two times, you go for a big amount. There's no point in going for a million dollars. Um, the last couple the town has gone for have been in the 10% area. I don't see why you, you change that. Huge change from the last time an override was sought is we are in substantially stronger financial position now. And the real question for everyone is, do we just let everything go to seed before we try again? Maybe, is that what's needed? That's what some people say. You're not going to get an override with $10 million or $8 million in the bank. That's not a rule. You know, that's a rule of thumb. There's no rule about it really comes, comes down to a discussion that we've had in many arenas of are the services that are required or requested by the community being delivered, and the answer is no. Um, unless someone else can find more revenue, then we just maybe shouldn't have such high hope for delivering those services, you know, and that's the other question. Um, there is a lot of discussion with FinCom and others about using free cash, and I understand that. Um, but there is the proper use for free cash when it falls out of the sky is to spend it on things like capital, a one-time use. Not to just keep plowing a million or two million every year into the budget. I understand we're in a position where there's really no choice right now, but fundamentally it's not a good idea. 
And if I keep saying that every year, maybe things will keep getting better, but that's what seems to happen. Um, again, health insurance, not really much we can do. We'll, we'll do the best we can, and we'll see how that works out. And the Finance Committee has informally uh, agreed to cut about 200000 out of the capital spending for the next two years, which is about a quarter of a percent. Um, we can easily afford that with all due respect to the capital plan because we are proposing yet another big slug of capital at November town meeting, 700 odd thousand. So if we keep doing big amounts in the middle of the year, that's where the proper placement of these one-time revenues belong, is doing capital, for instance, like that. So the capital plan, um, you know, Martha and I spend a lot of time on it, and it's not a happy thing because it's still a lot of unmet needs, but it is far better than the operating budget. So this is a reasonable sacrifice. The thing I would hate to see, and, and those in the room that go back uh, far enough will understand, is abandoning this discipline entirely and just saying, we can't afford to do capital anymore. Let's, let's get back to it when we can afford to do it again in a few years. Um, I remember when I was on the Finance Committee, there was one year in which, debt aside, there was um, $72,000 to spend on town and facilities capital, so it was split 36 and 36 without really knowing what it would be, but that's all there was. Um, we went through that type of budgeting for several years when times were tough. Uh, we ended up with fire trucks that were too old and started costing one to $150,000 a year to maintain more than they should have. So to cut your capital spending is fine for a short period of time. It's also a very poor idea to do too much cutting for a long period of time. And that's really the position we're in and the discussion that FinCon will now lead as to how much free cash to use. The first thing I'd like to do is kind of open this up for questions and comments. You've been presented quite a bit of information, both on kind of what happened in 14 and what we're talking about for, for going forward. Are there any, any thoughts that folks have that like to share? that information was in the budget you know people that spend a lot of time in these meetings and town meeting or whatever are generally aware but uh, and the same thing would apply in terms of there's that's the school budget has sort of the same amount of detail and, and transparency and information but um, you know where do we I, I'd like to see us talk a little bit more about how we're gonna communicate that and and position that because uh, then on the other side of that, when you make a cut, and it's a, a difficult cut, and you know the school committee had to make some cuts this year, and you finally come upon something that you think is manageable and we, we've looked at, and then it's you know the, then there might be some outcry about you know well that was that was picked to get attention, so this is sort of a this is the catch twenty two, and we are not and I don't think any board or committee picks a cut to get attention. Yet we sort of have this problem of how are we communicating the unmet needs without saying the fire truck won't get to your house in time. I mean, and I think we all know that we were just about there. At, was that 2003? Whatever, you know, before the 2003 override. So maybe not the right time right this minute, but I think we need to dialogue about it and figure out an approach. has to get out to the residents, the taxpayers, and the town meeting, and to be able to make particular evaluations on, on certain things. But I agree with you, the idea of kind of not letting anything flow through maybe is not the right approach. Did I see a hand in the back? No? Imagination, sorry. Um, okay, well, let me kind of open it up to FinCon. Any, any thoughts? One of the things that we need to do is kind of based on the discussions, based on what we're seeing, talk about a recommendation of how much free cash to insert to help revenues and to allow the planning of the budgets that are going to take place over the next few months. Any comments about it? All right, let me try to <laughs> um, Remember it's game seven. I know, I know, I know. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, 
we kind of presented where, what's going on where we are. Um, in some senses, we've budgeted, budgeted it reasonably conservatively, but we've been using 1.7, 1.9 million dollars of free cash, using it. And at the end of the day, we're finding that we end up with higher, higher reserve balance at the end, um, for different reasons each year, but it seems consistent. In fact, it's kind of a two million dollar bump that's, that's going on between the revenue and the cost side so far. None of them are going to last forever. Um, but we're in a slightly stronger position than I think we ever we ever thought we were going to be. Um, my kind of initial thinking, just to kind of put forward to the to the group here, is that I, I talked with Bob a little bit about maybe using this kind of two and a half kind of number, uh, two to two and a half percent, as a guideline. And and one of the things I actually wanted to point out, if you can go back just for the Bob to the um, the five year view slide just for a second, kind of early on in the pitch. Five year free cash, yes. So, you know, as much as this, you know, the certified balance at 630 estimate in fiscal 17 of 5.4 million dollars. Make that full screen. Okay. It doesn't get any better, it's just bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Those numbers are much bigger. <laughs> <laughs> they look bigger. Um, so just to realize, I mean, so that would be, you know, all else being the same, 5.4 million plus the uh, stabilization funds, things like that, actually puts us closer to $7 million on a budget of 80 something. So eight, 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 eight and a half percent. percent yeah. yeah, it's eight plus percent position still. So you know, one of the things I think we're all very sensitive to is because we intend to have capital projects, there's no reason for us to pay extra money in interest rates. We're somewhat blessed right now that interest rates are fairly low, but with the AAA rating, they're at the bottom. And that's wonderful. I don't think we want to be sacrificing that. It's a great opportunity to, to continue. Um, that said, I don't think we can squeeze too much more out of operating budgets. I don't see it happening that way. So the number that I kind of had, had lobbed forward as a starting point was $1.7 million kind of per year. To get to this you know, about 2.5%, percent about 2.5% in the first year, 2% in the second. Um, as kind of a starting point, as a recommendation. For everyone's benefit, most of the folks here are from the departments anyway, but this is the basis for figuring out what your budget for next year is gonna be. Setting the priorities, matching it to the dollars and seeing what, that, what the implications are. Um, it's not wonderful, it's a lot less than what we've been talking about in the past. You know, we're talking at three and a half percent, this is down closer to two and a half percent. Um, and I kinda wanna put that as a starting point, see where, where people are feeling comfortable or, or not comfortable. To Bob's point, as we talked about last time, just it's my last piece here. Um, I don't think we can go out there and kind of take the worst forecast for everything and, and say that we're doing a responsible job. And so what we suggested was that 8% in health, and if it buffers, you know, if it changes a few tenths of a percent or a percent from there, could we figure out how many percent is about 100,000. So it's about $100,000 per percent that we might be on. So for, if it's 10 and we budgeted eight, that's a $200,000 hit. Didn't, didn't you say at the last financial forum that historically the past five years, health insurance uh, increases have been about 6%, so that's kind of how, how we came to the eight, that it's more than it's been over the past few years, but not as high as the projections by the consultant. Yeah, and the six included enrollment increases, which actually haven't happened for the last year. I mean, who knows what's going to I think the other thing is that when we had the legislators in at the last session, um, they expressed surprise at, at the height of the numbers that we were suggesting might be in there. I think they were, they didn't anticipate that at all. I think it was surprising to me too, just considering what, considering, um, you know, health, healthcare cost containment legislation and kind of just some of the reading that I'd done outside, I hadn't seen anything that was, was as high as that. And I was thinking, of the, kind of the other, kind of seems like the other piece that's the big unknown is the state aid piece. But I think I was thinking about this um, after our last meeting um, when we were talking about how last year's Chapter 70 funding was funding was basically the same as the previous year plus the twenty-five dollar per pupil increase, which is basically like the bare minimum that any community would get as an increase. Um, so, so I would think that. 
that we would be conservative in our projections about state aid increases based on what happened last year. Um, if there's if there hasn't been this recognition that Reading it is not getting enough funding, so it should be getting a bigger increase. I don't. I, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, but it seemed like that's like pretty much the bare minimum that any community would get in a, in a chapter 70 increases the per pupil um, that pu per pupil increase. So I, I think I I I, I have learned that uh, I think the. The governor's budget, because it's going to be a new administration, is coming out later than in a typical year. So it'll be coming out in March of next year. Mm -hmm. um, so it usually comes out in January, but it'll be coming out in March. Uh, although um, there, you know, there still maybe could be an opportunity for the legislature to do some kind of local aid resolution like they did last year. So hopefully there could be a little bit more predictability. But just knowing that the governor's budget is coming out later, I would think that the uh, on the health care side, we're going to have some more predictability because we're going to learn about it earlier in December, but maybe on the state aid side, it'll be a little bit later than usual, just based on when things are getting started in the budget process. I do like the approach of what we're doing in taking realistic increases for both the health and the state aid and using free cash, because to me, that's what that account's there for, is that rainy day. So not, you don't want every year to be making some, oh, we're hearing this this year, let's make this assumption, let's make this assumption. I like the idea of using free cash for that, um, you know, rainy day, if all of a sudden the assumption was way off, because budgeting over 10% for healthcare, to me, also gets in an acceptance mode where we start to think, oh, if it comes in 9%, percent we are so lucky. I don't think we should be sitting here thinking we're lucky if we see a 9% increase. So I think we want to set ourselves up to feel outrage <laughs> appropriately. If, if we're seeing double-digit increases, we should feel outrage, and you're more apt to take action when you feel outrage. So I like that approach of being more reasonable with our assumptions. Um, I also like the 1.7 also because we are trying to be more reasonable with the assumptions, so we may have to dip into free cash if they're way off, so. So I'm wondering, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to go with the consistent uh, impact based on the free cash certified, um, but um, what is the potential upside of the part that we're going to cover of healthcare? Are we talking half, potentially half a million dollars, which really pushes it up to 2.2, because if we're up, if we're, we've committed to covering those, um, so if we do that, then there's not going to be, I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable that we're not looking at another 300 to come back to town meeting at the end of the year in November. I mean, so built into that 1.7 is what I have been committed to as well. So I think it's really good. I mean, for next year, it seems to. Yeah, I can answer some of that. Um, when, uh, when Dr. Gord and I were sitting in a meeting with uh, 17 years, consultant said the first paragraph above, there was practically 18 deaths right in the room. Um, national insurance trends were known to be an 8% to 11% core. And we thought that's what we were looking at, 8 to 11. And we thought, well, since we're doing an RFP, it'll come in less because everyone will fall on their swords and be competitive. So maybe we'll do 5 to 8. So that's what everyone in the room went in thinking. And what was explained to us is, oh no, it's 8 to 11 plus three to six because of the federal cost of the It's a nice name, it's not doing that. So that gets you to the 11 to 17% range, which is why the consultant said, if you're budgeting, you should go right in the middle and pick 14. Now, since we're doing an RFP, I'd like to think it's gonna be a lot better than 14, but I don't know. When FinCom made the decision to pick eight, 14 was the number that was on the budget. That's a $600,000 difference. Do I think it's going to be 14? I sure hope not. I don't think so. But if it is, it's average. And, you know, for the folks that are in the 5 to 10% kind of camp and they're not feeling as outraged as they should, um, you know, for those of you not as familiar with the small business market, you're looking at 50 to 75% increases. And you're looking about people losing their insurance completely. So this kind of a number at the federal level is not that 
difficult to put together and imagine. Um, so that if FinCom is thinking of what is this going to cost us in our first and second year, I don't know the answer. You know, best case, not very much. Maybe we do get an A or an L. Worst case, maybe we are looking at a 14. And depending on who the uh, selected carrier is, there's one carrier that can give us a two-year rate. If they will offer it and it's attractive, it fits in nicely to your model. So we'll have two years of uh, budget certainty and health insurance. But, you know, it's, it's nice from a budgeting standpoint that you've given us a number to work with. But from what it's going to cost, I have no idea. How do you know? And how much is the consultant motivated to make it lower? I feel like he's motivated to make it higher and come into here. He has a lot of angry people, right. some with weapons. Well, I would imagine that when the actuals come in, he can say, oh, thank goodness you hired me. Look, oh, I kept it off of, you know, off the center. Yeah, that, that's a hard question to answer. Um, he's very knowledgeable. I think where he's going to really earn his money is, as the bids are coming in, we don't, health insurance procurement is a little different. It's not like you have to take the bid and that's it. He negotiates with them and starts going in the back room and, and pounding them. So I'm optimistic that for the money we're paying, you know, five minutes of his good work saves us that amount. Um, but he's not going to change fundamentally the demographics of the employer employees and the fundamental nature of health insurance. That, that's the other piece is that, you know, comparatively, public sector is an older workforce. We, we're not built like a pyramid with a lot of young people coming in at the bottom. It's almost the opposite. Um, so we don't have the lower cost health insurance employees co-workers. So we have a tough demographic pool. That's just a fact. And we're no different than most cities and towns in that regard. It's not a growing business. So, uh, you know, the, the health insurance consultant will easily earn his money, but he can't change the fundamental facts of the fiction. Is it needed that way in part because not just because of the workforce, but because of the retirees? No, that's even excluding retirees, just completely separate. That, their, their rate of increase has actually been very modest over the last few years. That's where federal reform has done really well, especially on drug uh, payments. Mark? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to ask a clarifying question, because the, uh, so are we saying in this, in this budget document, the 8% is built in here for these two years as the town owns that. And then you've got the 1.7 million of free cash. But are you saying that if this comes in at 9%, then FinCom is going to put that additional, or is it coming out of the 1.7? Additional. Okay. Just, okay. But I have something different that's before. Not, and that's the reason why you know, we can't come out and say, oh, let's put it in $2.5 million. Let's go for it. Because we're suggesting that we want to kind of have a, a, a more conservative is the wrong approach, but I think realistically we the right one on this. So that this you know, 1.7, again, to me, it's, it's a comment. It seems like a reasonable number to use based on holding those others and covering both bridges. Hopefully we luck out. You know, we look at, at revenues and costs. The last four years in a row, there's been a $2 million delta every single year. Yet we're only talking about 750000 going forward. That's pretty conservative. This is the first time I've gone through um, the town budgeting process. Um, so since in, Dece in December we'll have the, the health insurance numbers, will we be able to, to revise at that point what, what our assumptions are? Um, the goal is not to, but I mean, clearly if something is, is off. It's a 40% increase, I think we would all not have a problem coming back. <laughs> But you know, the goal here is to allow the departments to kind of build what things are going to look like. Okay. And if we give them a two-year horizon, or as close to a two-year horizon as possible, um, you know, there were some things last year that we talked about that I'll, I'll pick on something, you know, one thing on the town side that seemed to make a whole lot of sense. I think everybody supported it, but there was a fear that it could only last for one year. And that didn't really meet the need. So it wasn't put through. It was taken away. Even when it was given additional funds, it wasn't pushed through. So what we're hoping is that we can give a more balanced view of that. Let the town look out a couple of years. I mean, we're doing it with capital beautifully. That's wonderful. But can we look at kind of what the, the town people infrastructure is going to be? 
Chuck. Uh, uh, I guess I'm still struggling with the, the 14 percent, percent a little bit. Uh, did the consultant, uh, did they shed any light on our own experience? I mean, does that contemplate our town's loss experience or Maya's experience or? Because it's not, I, mean, I, I, I get the demographics and all that, but 14% is, is not consistent with what's out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to answer most of your questions, but I'll answer some of them. Um, the 14% is indicative of where you are today to where you might go. There's very strong acknowledgement that where we are today is lower than anyone would reasonably expect you to be based on all the fundamental factors. What's lost is 14% sounds terrible. We should be 10% higher. That's sort of the nature of what's going on here. So you know, where we're in negotiations, I don't want to open the whole can of worms, but we've absolutely had very thorough discussions about all of that stuff. And I will say, generically speaking, uh, unions have done a really nice job. Um, they've bargained very effectively. We're doing a really good job on keeping the cost down. But that only makes it harder to keep the future increases down because you're already at such a low base. So yeah, the consultant is very familiar with our loss experience, our current insurance program. Yeah. The health plans are changing so dramatically. It seems like all companies are going to be high deductibles. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and you save a lot on the premium and it gives you more flexibility to put money away and save it. One of the other things we'll talk about, which I don't mind sharing, which is really scary, is offering, um, I don't know what they're called, but I'll call them disaster health insurance plans. They're generally taken by young people. They have an enormously high deductible. Uh, and as the union is, is generally a little more senior, and certainly the town manager is, do we want to expose our employees to that kind of risk? We don't think so. Nine of them will be really happy, and the 10th one will lose their house doesn't seem prudent. So yeah, we'd like to be able to afford those disaster policies yeah. as well, yeah. if there's a disaster. Um, yeah, and we've talked about sort of the town stepping in as co-insurer, if you will, if, if it was economic. But you know, we're also not an insurance company, so we don't want to go too far afield there. Um, so yeah, we're, we're open-minded to some of these changes with a certain bit of a caution that we don't want to ruin people's lives. I guess I'd just add on to you know what you guys have been saying on, on the three million seven and, and kind of comfort in that level. I agree that more to your point before, not that it's a conservative number, but it seems to be a realistic number. Every year, for one reason or another, there's some level of regeneration. We can't put our finger on it right now, but it seems reasonable that some of that will offset what we are likely to have to make up for on the on the insurance side. Um, you know, we've talked about the override, the, the potential of an override, and how would that play given the free cash balance we have right now. And, you know, at a million seven, with the potential that that goes up a little bit if things fall in the wrong direction, we're at least moving slowly towards, I don't want to say a disaster scenario, we're still leaving ourselves enough runway, you know, to react before we are in, in too drastic a situation. So I think I share a similar, similar level of comfort and, and would also characterize it as realistic rather than conservative. One thing we should talk about, one second, one thing we should talk about too, this discussion really is about the operating budget, not about free cash, uh, but we turn it on its head pretty regularly. What we're trying to do is figure out how to how to let the town operate, and you know we're used to massive increases of three percent. Well, we're not talking about that here. We're not going to get there. I don't see that. At least not with that 1.7. It's not there. So um, I would anticipate, and you know, the part of you can tell me right or wrong. I mean, it, it's not such a rosy number. Um, it's plus. That's good, but it's not enough to sustain. I don't think, is it? Here's okay. the last three years, three six, three seven five, and three point five. 
Yeah, I, I would this say there was general gloom in most of those years. There was what, general gloom? There was, maybe there was general gloom. There was more than general gloom, but maybe it didn't get expressed very well. Um, I, You're playing with that one. Operating budget for yeah. the last three years, or it was around three and a half to three and three quarters okay. percent. I mean, so Mark, Mark this year, we've talked a little bit about it, but you know, clearly these these numbers are better than one or one and a half or zero, and the one point seven certainly helps us get there. But just you know, that does mean that does mean cuts. It means programs. It's you know, it's it's going to be killing back things that at least. Whether you're talking about schools and towns, it's going to be constituents that are going to be unhappy. And when you look at the two-year view, I think the two-year, you know, trying to look at a two-year view is a, is a very good idea. Uh, but it also, at least for school um, school programs and implementing curriculum, and it really needs a three-year window to do that. That basically means, to me, you know, there were some programs that we were in year one or two. We had to actually do some trimming. This means that. You know, as you move forward, you have to really question whether you can do that. And really, the answer is, well, I could be speaking for, for Craig or, or anyone, but in, in general, you don't want to start what you cannot finish because it's a waste of money. It, it you lose the teacher confidence and you don't serve the students. So, you know, one of the things that really concerns me, uh, you know, about looking at this is it really. In order for us, if we were to determine that there was some program, whether it's English or math, or you know something that we need to change or bring in, we would just about have to take something else out in order to bring something in that would be a higher priority. And just in terms of unmet needs, and this this is going to be another one of those, um, you know, a lot grayer hair and a lot less hair budget sessions for all of us. And for me. It doesn't even come close to, again, us talking about for the schools, where would we be if we could be average, if we could spend um, you know, at that state average. And that is a huge gap for this community. Really do. But that, this is, so this, these, this is going to be a, um, you know, this is going to mean some pain. Um, you know, and when we, so that's why it's important, I think, to be, you know, conservative and accurate, but um, you know, then then we look at it and say, you know, well, if you could have and you know another half a percent, what does that allow you to do differently? Uh, but you know, just the timing. I'm especially concerned about the timing of the um, governor's budget. And if that's late and that's March, that's going to sort of you know not invoke those opportunities. But you know, obviously. Going to just be an extremely difficult year. I'm really concerned about how we get that message out in terms of um, this is, I think this is the beginning of a much faster downward path towards doing structural damage than we think. I think we've spent the last couple of years sort of managing and getting by and using the free cash and somehow regenerating positively, but I think this is. Uh, an off place where we're going to really start to accelerate um, if we don't come up with some other revenue um, proposal. So, Mr. Brown in the back. Hi. Uh, to Mrs. Webb's point, uh, I went to my little library before I came down. In 1915, the same problem. We're not spending enough on education. Where the hell is the end? I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would love to have. But I can't. I have to pay my tax bill. Everybody says, well, why don't you have email? I can't. I have to pay my tax bill. And I like to eat. And my insurance has gone up, but my Social Security will not like up to meet it. And there's a hell of a lot of us in this town in the same situation. I have a great deal of sympathy, but I think what has happened, quite frankly, I think the school system in Reading has been oversold, and people have come in expecting a miracle, and then when they face the reality, they don't like it. 
And that's what I think has happened over the years. They moved in this town because we supposedly have a wonderful school system, which we probably do. But they get disappointed when they don't get what they think they should have. dispatch should be being run now. I don't think there's really much disputing that. Um, I talked to the chief, who's not here today, but I'll speak to him. Um, both of us in good conscience could accept the money for it, but not hiring one until about this time of year, and that's what we told him. And the message we got back was, you don't get the money then. So what you told us was, be reckless. Go ahead and just do it. That's a really dangerous message for Finkham. In our judgment, it was, it's a good thing to have. If we can really think we can see far enough into the future and keep it, we'll, we certainly want it. But we both agreed, what's the sense in hiring two people, putting them through you know, as much training as they need, and then needing to lay someone else off, if not them? So that's a position that both the schools and the town are in, and it sort of comes back to Elaine's point earlier. Is we don't want to make cuts that make dramatic impacts on the community just to make noise. But really, you have to be real careful about what message you deliver to the, deliver to the town and schools and how to run their operation. Because if you want it run recklessly, I'll, I'll do the best I can. I don't know how capable I am, but I could. And you know, there's a reason you have such good financial numbers for years in a row, is because that's not how we operate. But we could. But I think that's what we all do, <coughs> frankly. Yeah. And it's that. that's exactly the people that we have working in, in town government they won't behave recklessly, and we do count on that. And that's the reason why we, I think, we feel we can make some decisions that way. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is that in going to a two-year view, the hope is it's not three, but it's two, that there is a longer horizon to take a look at things. And, and you know, my, my counter to your point would be, you know, if having that, that dispatcher in was such a high priority, then that's what should have happened. Um, and not putting it in there said to me, it wasn't such a high priority. Well, FinCom not, chose not to add 80000 because the comment was, we won't hire anyone for six months if you put the money in there. Right. And the result was, you don't get the money. Okay. And, and Fair enough. enough. One option on that might be the, the idea of uh, merit-based activities. That are, you know, there's kind of a budget that's set, just as we're talking about. And then there's the notion that there are going to be some merit-based activities that kind of come to the top. And they're not 60-40. They don't work that way. They're 100-0. Yeah, the row 100. And we see what those priorities are for the town. And those are the ones that get funded. And, and those have worked very well in the past. Again, I wish John was here, and, or Jimmy. But um, four or five of us sat down three years ago and talked a lot about our CASA and school efforts in the same line. And we came up with a two year plan for you know, $400,000 this year, $200,000 in the second year, all towards the genero generic sort of substance abuse slash emotional health issues on both sides. We threw them in as a community priority. We completely agreed, and FinCom funded it. It was great. It worked out really well. So that's a really nice construct. But you have to make sure that by doing all that, you're not then putting at risk something else, that it really has to be available. And I think what you're saying now, that's when free cash use was much lower. And now, frankly, if, if we came up with the same idea again and said we need 400000 we would all know that even though you say you can have it, there's a big risk to something being cut in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's, it's kind of like, there's no such thing as the free lunch anymore because of the free cash that's being used. 
Right, but we don't expose our shortfalls if we, if, and I get it. I know. I get it, but we wonder why we can replenish for cash. It's because we're so worried about spending the budget we have. So then it's it's sweeping it under the rug in a way. Yeah. And I, I really understand you don't want to hire a position and then lay it off, but then it looks like, oh, wow, look at how we can regenerate. We don't spend our budgets. So I. Yeah. No, I know. It's hard. We lose that credibility. Other comments? I keep talking about it all night, but it was, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, I, this, two, this two year view, I'm, this is. The two year view is great if year two is higher. Because <laughs> then you can say, you know, okay, we'll, you know, we'll be able to do this piece of it this year. We'll take on this a little more slowly, and we'll we'll be able to have the resources. I just look at this, and I, I look at this and say, it's going to really that two-year view should, if I'm looking at it responsibly, really impact you know the decisions that we're also making this year about the budget. And it's clearly. Uh, you know, it, with the way it's positioned currently at uh, sort of a 2% mark when we're used to three and a half, um, you know, is, is going to make it, it's, it's going to make even this year's decisions more challenging. I, I don't know how Martha or John or, or Craig plan on really trying to sort of work through that to, to show us, but, um, and I completely respect Mr. Brown. I could not do more than respect him. But I am on the school committee, and the people voted me to be on the school committee. And I, I'm only on for one year, so this is, this is what I'm supposed to do for our community, is to look at what we need to do for our education system. And this is just, you know, it's just not going to be sufficient. It's, it's cuts, um, and we as a community got to step up and figure out a different revenue position. I, I understand. Lots of people will hate me for saying the override word, but it's been, you know, it'll be 12 years by the time we sort of get around to that. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're, we're not gonna make, we're not gonna make the cuts that, to create attention. And the school department is so creative every year, always trying to figure out how to make those cuts hurt the least where it counts the most, and that's in front of the kids. And they're the ones who lose out when we can't we can't step up. So it, it, as I kind of we started the meeting, I, I encourage organized groups where you feel that there's a priority that's absolutely not being met. That is the stuff that, that pushes forward overrides and other activities that help the fund. Um, but you know, to Bob's point, that there's, there's only so much we can push and pull. And you know, we could come in and we could be extremely conservative and say, okay, let's take the 14%, let's go 1% on state aid, and guess what your budget will look like? Zero, maybe less. Right. So, you know, it, it's, and I guess that, that's our discussion as FinCom, you know, does this feel um, reasonable? Uh, we could certainly be a whole lot more conservative if we wanted to be. Um, but my feeling is that that actually harms other things as well. It harms us from doing what we need to do to support it. Yeah. I think it's going to harm those things. It's going to keep, it's going to level set expectations down lower too, which is then going to move towards, well, compounding one of the problems that, okay, we lower expectations of what we can and will deliver. We eat less into free cash, which then says, pushes us further and further away from an override. Impact forces us, whether that's people's intent or not, to essentially lower expectations and lower services. And I think that's why, you know, I for one never feel good about using free cash for anything other than, you know, the, the emergency is the one off to, to, to balance expectations, but we need to find some common we need to We need to find something in the middle that, you know, allows for as close as we can to meeting the needs that people have said are important so far. And I agree. If, if, those aren't being met, or there are things that the townspeople want. You know, that's where the two-year view is helpful because when year two doesn't look that good, all right, we're giving people a runway. I think the more we can talk about year two, you know, hopefully it will be helpful to kind of the, the town people in general to energize some of the voice from the townspeople to say, okay, 
I can now see out two years and not only is this not going to get any better, we won't be able to maintain at this level that I currently don't think is good enough. Um, and that might be, you know, the more we can talk about a two-year window, I think we'll get, hopefully, more of a voice from the town. And we still have to come up with the revenue side of it, but, you know where I'm going. I just want to echo what both you and Paul said. I think that we're putting forth something that's really reasonable. And if we start on a reasonable footing, anything that falls outside of what, that reasonableness will sort of rise to the top and people will do what they need to do to make sure that stuff happens. And like Paul said, the two year view is gonna, gonna hopefully spark that, the conversation that needs to happen in town. about making sure we meet all the services that people want. So, I, I have a question. Um, the, the budget cuts are going to hurt, and I think that the budgets on all, in all departments are going to feel it. We generated a list of other revenue ideas. I'm wondering what's happening with that list. So, because I think that as long as there is this kind of free cash, a debt, an override's not going to go because. We have money there. We just want to save it for the capital expenses, but there, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there is money there. We don't want to spend it to offset the needs right now that our different departments have, whether it's a dispatcher or whether it's curriculum specialists or whatever it is, that's a line item, but the needs that the schools have, just as examples, because I know the other budgets have needs too. But so we generated a list. What are we going? How are we going to proceed to find some of these other revenue, revenue generators within even that two-year span you're proposing? Because we need to start now to have the money available for the budgets as we go along. Upstairs at the Council on Aging meeting late uh, last week. And these are the people you don't usually see in the school system. Um, Bill is a very reasonable guy compared to many people in town who feel much stronger than he just expressed. So that there's that part. But just to put it in perspective, which really is scary to me, is let's just pretend we had the 10% override yesterday. We have another six million dollars. It would seem reasonable to me that that ought to include the library debt exclusion. We should have tucked that into an override in the past. We're using free cash. You really shouldn't use free cash in the budget. The first six million, of the six million dollars, the first three and a half goes away immediately because you should be paying the debt for the library and you shouldn't be using free cash and all this health insurance buffering. To me, that's a really scary thought. We've already used up three and a half out of six million that we're afraid to go ask for. And if we had it, we had it, we'd now be thinking, how do we spend the other two and a half? And it wouldn't be nearly enough, but it would certainly be a different discussion. So that's the picture that needs to get out to the community. Is it's not scary now by not having an override because we happen to have a lot of free cash. It hurts a little every year, it hurts a little, it hurts a little. But the fundamental situation that the situation the town is in, absent free cash, is terrible. There's, there's no getting around that. And it's getting a million dollars worse every year, absent it regenerating itself magically. So that's a tough message to get to the town when you still are, um, in all ways, providing good levels of service and good amounts of service to the community. But, you know, the outlook looks poor, and it has for years. We've managed to creatively avoid the real problems, and, and we all know we're running out of kind of those bags of tricks, but to think that more than half the override is already spent, to me, is very frightening. <coughs> Because then you're already looking for the second award. Well, but there are some other options here, too. For example, where can we get money that essentially the state is doling out? So, so maybe the Preservation Act, we need to look at it. Mm -hmm. well, that's not, well, let's, let's try to map what's on the right and what's on the left. Uh, now, there are three items on, on the right side that require asking the folks for more, more fees, the trash fee, the override, the CPA. I see the override mapping to a, a number of the unmet needs on the left. 
I don't see CPA doing that. That's primarily a, a way of purchasing you know, open space. I didn't see that listed anywhere on the left. So, well, so yeah, athletics and fields. Historic buildings and libraries. Yeah, but there's other ways of doing that that don't involve having to raise taxes. And, and that's a very specific target for that money. Our, our needs are more general to fund the operating budgets. And CPA does not do an awful lot of that. You gotta pick your battles on this for the reasons Bob said and Bill said. If you're gonna go to the folks for more money, target your opportunities. And uh, I don't see CPA as the right way to go there. A lot of people do right now, but I think it, it would warrant some more discussion. Yeah, I think that's all we're suggesting is this discussion. There's some one-time things up there. Um, the use of public land to generate, well, revenue stream would be continuous, but sale of land, things like that, those are the properties that are left. No. That's something we brought up. Total all those up, it really doesn't make much of an impact. Right. Even an optimistic view on, on a lot of those items, it's it's maybe maybe you can get a million dollars, but um, that's not going to solve anything. There's, there's no fantasy. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the, the big cone is over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Barry yeah. has yeah. a high So, so um, my point would be, if the odd one go ask for additional funds, like you know, we, we don't need to look closely at what we're currently doing. We can see if there's anything that we're doing that we don't need to do as well as what we, we have as needs for. Um, we've done some really good um, consolidations with um, health department per se and um, the uh, building inspectors and so forth. Are there other ways to do that? We're doing with food services in the school department. But, but looking even deeper, like what is actually, you know, what, what is the, the makeup of the school department budget? What is the makeup of the town side budget? And what I think, because sometimes I get the feeling, I haven't been in this for a long time, that something gets funded and, you know, things are going along pretty well. And, you know, maybe what was funded 15 years ago doesn't need to be funded anymore. Or maybe there's no value to it. And, but it's still being funded. And I know we've looked at different things and there were some cuts that I was displeased with on the school committee side last year that I think we're desperately in need of, if not more, not if more, definitely need more in terms of uh, health prevention. But I, I just have to wonder, you know, what, what can we do to look at what we're currently doing and see if there's things we, we're doing that we don't need to do anymore. <clears throat> yeah, Mark. Uh, consolidation doesn't necessarily have to say, can save you money. And a point, case in point, presently a, a, the town manager and some of the board of selectmen want to consolidate the DPW down at uh, New Crossing Road and bring the cemetery department down there. It will cost the cemetery department between ten and $12,000 a year just to have men riding in trucks doing nothing. And to me, that is not a valuable thing. There'll be, and 400 working hours a year doing absolutely nothing. So there's a case where, in my, my thoughts, consolidation does not work. And Coincidentally, the 12 uh, peer communities that we like to uh, judge ourselves with, not one of them, not one of them, consolidate their cemetery department with their DPW, including Lexington that, that just completed that $18 million building. So they may know something that we don't. I don't know. We had uh, the board of selectmen meeting last year. One of the fundamental disconnects in this room is that the communities you like to compare yourself, if you look at them statistically, virtually all of them are paying significantly higher property taxes than Reading is. So this is a right. wannabe. We want to be these ones. We want to be these ones. We're not. We're Reading. So if you want to be those communities, and we all should want to be, and the residents want it, guess what? It's called override. Um, North Reading, on, on an average single family home right now, North Reading pays about $1,200 more than we do. A lot of people are surprised by that. Um, you know, the fundamental facts are the towns that we all like to be and compare ourselves to have much higher tax bills. Um, that doesn't help the discussion with all the residents that I, that I and many of you talk to, which don't want to pay more taxes, and I understand all that. 
but you can't not pay more taxes and have those expectations. That's the problem. One of those two things has to change, or some combination thereof. And, and you know, to, to play off of that, we had a visitor last night at that at that meeting, um, and it was a, uh, and he was there in a very respectful way, with the Chronicle in his hand, and he wanted to. He had never been down to a selectman's meeting. He knew he wanted to talk about something, but he didn't know the right place to do it. And because it was tied to the tax assessment, um, that was the right place instead of at the public meeting. And he sat and listened to the whole presentation. And you know, he was there to let us know. Um, you know, this was a th this was a man with a young family, and he read in the Chronicle that his taxes were going to go up three and a half percent yesterday. And he was down to you know, voice his displeasure with that, which is absolutely his right. Um, and, and I understand, um, I mean, there was a time when I was raising three small kids and, you know, you start to look around and the money's going everywhere and I get that. And at the same time, you, you know, you want good schools and you want good libraries and you want good roads and, you know, you want good everything. Um, but there is a place that you gotta, people need to be aware of the things that we're talking about. And that needs to get out there because, as Bob points out, all you have to do, we looked last night, and Bill, you talk about Lexington. If you, if you want what Lexington has, you have to pay what Lexington pays. And it's substantially more than what we pay here in Reading. So these are things that you have to, you know, you've got to sort these things out. You know, when this gentleman that came down to, you know, um, to exp express his displeasure with his taxes being raised three and a half percent because the Chronicle said that was going to happen, when he realized that the tax rate went down, but the value of his home went up, which is what was going to cause this net m increase in taxes of three and a half percent, it wasn't because there was a bigger tax levy being, the value of the property went up. And you know what? You can't spend that if you're living in it and, you know, trying to raise a family and try to, you know, do all the things that you do. So there's a fundamental disconnect that's going on between what people's perception is and what the reality is. So, you know, we just really need to get to the bottom of finding out what people want. You know, I mean, do they want a 4% increase so that everything can get funded okay but here's what that costs there's a you know the money's not dropping out of the sky i don't care who the governor is they're not sending it okay we're going to have a new governor they're not sending it um, we have to find a way to do it ourselves and if we want it then we've got to make that decision that we want it. but just based on a newspaper headline we had a visitor that said, what are you doing to me? And then he kind of realized it and, you know, and he said he felt silly, but he shouldn't have felt silly because he was expressing how he felt about something. And that's what we should all do. And so, you know, I, when you look around this room, I mean, look, we're the same people all the time. We're having the same discussion over and over. And I get the TV, the TV is running too, so I hope people are listening. But people need to understand if they want more, they pay more. Um, if we live with this budget, then we have to live with the consequences of this budget and, you know, maintain a tax base where it is. So the bigger question is, uh, I think to Bob's point, it's like, uh, okay, what's it going to be? Uh, because you have a million seven of spending out of the, out of the, out of the, um, I just hate the, the term free cash. Uh, out of the, out of the rainy day account is what we call it at 75 Beaver Road, we call it the rainy day account. Um, you don't spend that unless there's an interesting one-time opportunity or, you know, something that goes wrong. Yet, we are spending it, and we kind of have to, and I get that. But, you know, we live on the edge because, you know, if it's a 14% increase, we're going to spend, you know, 2.4. 2.4, not 1.7. And so that kind of, 
I mean, when you when you spend that that way, you if you shut down capital, then you have a near term, you know, savings and a long term disaster. Because you know the maintenance and the capital expenditures, you know you've got to save that money for that stuff if you possibly can. So I think we keep bringing our hands. All of us in the same room keep bringing our hands. I mean, let's either get on with it or not. Let's find out what's going on. Um, so we stop torturing ourselves. I think that's what you got to do because that's what's happening. I look at the same faces all the time, um, and we're all torturing ourselves here. Uh, I have a new face. New face. <laughs> I saw a new face. That's very nice. Well, so are, we, are we certain that um, with, the, with what we're thinking about doing now, that will result in cuts to town and school services as a result? Because although there's an increase um, over last year's budget, the, the increase in the costs are are increasing at a greater rate. So that's a contractual contractual increases to clear more. Yeah, the, the contractual increase to the teachers next year is 3%. Okay. So just for that one, it's 80% of your budget. Mm -hmm. so. I think the options are we could be very draconian, very draconian. Um, but again, you know, and, and John, I, I agree with all your points. I think the, the one caveat I throw at it is that with all the best efforts of everybody in this room, everybody in the town, we've been regenerating a lot of stuff. So as much as we've said, uh, you know, boy, the rainy day fund's gonna decrease. We, we found a way to kinda not have that happen so far. So far, but you know, you can't, you can't look out on the horizon and forecast where that's coming from. That's, I mean, right. we heard, you know, um, just a few, you know, Sharon said, you know, depending on how an auditor looks at something, there could be 700,000 that disappears yeah. instant. Right. You know, because of, you know, you have to reserve for, you know, abatements. <coughs> I, these are the kinds of, that's... Yeah, no, that's, that's where we are. What, that's what you save it for. You do not save it, you know, to turn the lights on. I, I guess that's, that's my point. And, and I get that we've had this regeneration, and so I do think what you put up there in a million seven is, I'm not s suggesting that we shouldn't spend it. What I'm suggesting is, you gotta pick a number that's realistic. You, I've heard several of you want to think I'm use that. I think that's right. I mean, so okay. Yeah. And then let's just keep our fingers crossed that the insurance premiums aren't here and the and, and the state aid is there. And I mean there's a lot of what ifs and that the auditor doesn't say reserve that off, you know, off. I mean all of those things could happen. Realistically are all are all gonna happen at once, probably not. So that kind of approach is good. I just think we have to be cautious that we don't overdo that. Yeah, well, I hope you're hearing caution. In what yeah, I do. I, 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 I actually think that this yeah, approach this is very good. What you're, what you're showing. Just want to throw out a little thing. I'm very happy to hear this whole conversation going on because I was on the thing um, the time of the last override. Um, I think everything is working sort of the way we wanted it to. When we put in the minimum free cash and this that general idea of not of sort of really creating a maintenance budget a capital budget that we we're going to stick to and not cut those because I don't know how many of you I know Bob could talk about this and Chuck could talk about it but before the last override our creative way of getting you know avoiding the override as long as possible was we spent all our free cash and we did very little in the way of capital and maintenance for a bunch of years to avoid you know to make the town feel like everything was going okay when it really wasn't and so after that crisis was over and we got the, the override that we needed we basically created the policy that we weren't going to dip below 5% of the budget for free cash, um, that we would stick with our capital and our maintenance no matter what. I mean, that those will not be touched just because things get tight. And so this is exactly, you know, and so we built up free cash, we built, we built up a little excess in some of the good years, which is great. It meant that we basically didn't say, oh, here's a great year, let's spend everything we possibly can. We actually built up a little extra free cash, and now that we see the free cash starting to go down and we see the line, this is exactly what was supposed to happen. We say, you know what, we're on our way back towards the bad days, and now is the time to start talking about it until not not waiting for the zero cash point. Um, so I think this is perfect, and it's just a question of, and there's there's almost no doubt, and I know people hate it, but two and a half, prop two and a half was built to force overrides somewhere along the lines of every 10 to 15 years, because we did this analysis last time, we'll try and do it again this time. 
we had lived within Prop 2 and a half completely before the last override for 12 years or something. 10 years, 12 years, I forget exactly. Except for special ed and health insurance. If you took those two out, we live within Prop 2 and a half. And I'm sure if we look at it this time, I bet the overall budgets have gone up about the, you know, the amount we can afford under two and a half. And it's a couple of these things, health insurance in particular, maybe some energy this time, and maybe special, I'm not sure how that's going, but there's going to be a couple of things that are driving it that are basically outside the town's control. We manage our budgets within Prop 2 and a half, except the few things that we can't really control. And I think it's very important. You, know, you talked about sort of consolidation and savings or things we're doing. One thing I just sort of know in general about the town is we are pretty conservative. I, I've heard plenty of neighbors come up to me who've never been to a FinCon meeting, never been in town meeting, and they're like, oh, everyone knows government is rife with waste everywhere you turn. I'm like, well, come on down and help me find it. Because I think all the meetings, it's not there. And we gotta just make people, I mean, it's a, just a common belief. Big government, wasteful government, wasteful spending, programs that aren't going anywhere. And you know, Bill, I know it seems like there's a perpetual need for funding in the schools. I wish it wasn't true, I don't know why it always seems to be, but our spending is still well below the state average on a few per pupil basis on everything. And there's some great databases out there that you can get to sort of compare spending across towns. Get people to look at this stuff. We are not wasting money. You know, plenty of other towns are way worse off than we are. Um, and people need to understand that. But um, you know, this is exactly the right conversation to be having at exactly the right time because, you know, and it's not, we aren't in a crisis mode, and we shouldn't feel bad about spending, the, I think, the 1.7 million of free cash, because that was the idea, is build up some cash in the good years, and when you see it going down, now's the time you have the discussion before you hit the, the crisis. So I'm happy to be here. Okay. I, um, I actually agree with pretty much what everyone has said, um, and with that in mind, I think it would really be important if we are talking about um, introducing an override in the need, I think at the same time we do have to show the town that we are actually making um, some cuts um, and that it is, quote, serious, not, you know, not in a dramatic way. And one of the questions I had that was up there about the, the, um, the trash fee, have, uh, and maybe the town manager can answer this, um, because there are a lot of towns actually that um, don't pick up trash. Had you thought about cutting back trash and keeping the recycling weekly and cutting back trash pickup to just twice a month or once a month and force, you know, force us to be more green at the same time making some cuts in services that serve a greater good. Is that something that you can do with the current contract with the recycling people? Um, if you're actually talking about reducing trash pickup, we'd have to hire two people to bodyguard me all <laughs> um, that's never going to work. Um, even, if, uh, even if it's a way of making people take, you know... You know, you know Reading is, you know, like, Reading is close to the forefront of efficiency, if you will, in recycling versus trash. Uh, the town of Stoneham this summer, I think it was in July, just went to Reading's model, um, and they cap the amount of trash you can throw out, and they force you to recycle. And I happened to be in the town administrator's office the morning, the first morning when it happened. Yeah. You know, it was awful. But a month or two later, he's absolutely thrilled. He's saving eighty thousand dollars a year. We saved three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, we've already squeezed that issue as efficiently as we can without being unreasonable to people. Now, a trash fee is a whole another issue, and that's something that these guys decide, and a, and a board of selectmen, you know. 1,432 years ago promised to never do it. And, and it's just another tax. But the idea of just a bi-monthly trash pickup and weekly recycling, do you know towns that do that? I don't know of any. Do you, Jeff? I don't know of any that do that. I know some that pick it up twice a week, actually. But what I'm saying is that, you know, I don't know what our trash, when we started doing the recycling and it was mandatory, did you see a reduction, though? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. definitely reduction in trash. In trash. Our, our recycling went from 17 percent to like 30 percent. Right. Our recycling at 30 percent in town is the highest on any place that doesn't have a beige as well. So, so with that in mind, I'm, I'm assuming if you force people, they will recycle more. If you take away two trash pickups. Well, the other part of the equation also is we have two years left on the current contract. Okay. But regardless of that, I mean, it's subject to negotiation. But 
Um, but that's that was probably the case. Move the question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just it's just a way of making some you know if people it's what you're saying you get, you get what you pay for so yeah. remembering the first financial forum mm -hmm. we we didn't we not only discussed unmet needs but we talked about areas where maybe the town um, was providing services that were not really necessary. And the, that list was considerably shorter than the list of unmet needs. So I'm sure that that cuts will be felt, um, that they'll be, they'll be felt in a very real way, I'm sure. Your last comment, and then Vicki will move the question. I think one of the um, things that would be good in terms of communicating with people, because I know it, even still I struggle to understand it. Um, so <coughs> free cash, the stabilization, the Sorry, the uh, finance reserves, the stabilization, oh, sick buyback, stabilization for roads, all these funds that it looks like there's a ton of money there. Why do we need an override? So I think one of the things in terms of our communication is to make sure that we're being really clear about what those amounts are and what they're designed to be. And I don't know if we can relabel free cash, but it is a really bad name. Like, I, I know in the schools, if we could have, if we, sh we should have changed the name of our algebra class to Math 1 and Math 2. It would have helped us a lot this past uh, year. So I, don't, I just wish, you know, at least there should be in brackets. What does that really mean? Because people just think, I think somebody else, I think it was Linda, made the point that you, you know, you're going to try to communicate this, but people aren't really feeling that it's painful. We, we see where it's going. So I think we need some help communicating that so that when new people do get into the process, they have some clue. If the names make some sense to something that they can get their hands around. Or call it expensive cash. There you go. Um, <laughs> I don't know the reason for it, although I suspect it's, it's, it's the thing you're talking about, but the communities we aspire to be like often have less free cash optically, but lots of other funds. Uh -huh. The most common one is a capital stabilization fund which sometimes can be 10% of the whole capital budget plus debt. So that could be, in Reading's case, millions of dollars in this fund as a rainy day for capital. What if something breaks that we hadn't had in the capital plan? What if something happens, um, you know, whether it be water, sewer, or other infrastructure, um, that we're going to need this fund and we just don't have it in the operating budget to be able to pull money out? So FinCom and I have briefly talked about you know, it doesn't mean to be disingenuous, but in a sense, do you want to disguise free cash in those ways? Do you want to set up a rainy day fund for capital? Um, there's no need for it. We're all kind of grown-ups. <laughs> but it would help in that sort of PR optics sense that, no, that's not cash. That's for a very specific rainy day need, if it should arise. And we won't ask you for an override if that problem happens, because we've got it covered. So that's what some of the towns do. Um, they have a lot more uh, stabilization and other funds than Reading does. We have to have a lot of free cash uh, at the moment. The other um, aspect of that is that we have a triple A rating because we have a certain amount of cash. So yeah. maybe we could communicate how this represents as a, a the percentage of our budget budget on an ongoing basis, and there, in terms of communication, comment on you know what are the rating agencies looking for in terms of. If you're going to have fifty thousand dollars in cash, free cash, then your bond rating goes down to B plus, and that raises the cost of borrowing, and that's going to cost you more money too. So maybe it's just something we can communicate as well. Someone to think I want to make a motion that would say something like one point seven million dollars. <laughs> I'll propose we recommend using one point seven million in free cash. I feel like we keep losing I know, I right? Right. Oh, I'm 16 right? Um budget. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? That's unanimous. Uh, Chris, a, a quick a quick comment and I hope it comes up the right way. One thing that we might try to do is we talked about a two and a half percent increase to the budget. And I think the town might hear that. They might hear, oh. Things aren't so bad, 2.5% increase, that's pretty good. Maybe what we should do is be more realistic and let the town know that that's more about a 2, 2.5% decrease. 
when we cover last year's expenses, right? So I hope people don't think that we, I know that everyone in this room knows that, but I hope people don't realize or think at home, two and a half percent, great, hopefully that's another teacher. That does not mean that at all. That actually means that we're gonna have to find, I, I don't know what the exact number is, I wish it was, but we're, very, we're probably looking at a minus two percent budget. Yeah. So I, I, I just wanna make that comment, maybe, Instead of talking about all this free cash, we really should be making sure that the town of Reading realizes our budgets are all being cut significantly for next year. So please don't come after us looking for services, our operating budget. But well, I think that's a really important message because absolutely that headline looks like oh good. Mm. Well, you know, the, the headline will be tomorrow's budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the budget increases by two and a half percent, just like the headline two days ago. Yeah. was, you know, that your property taxes are going up, you know, three and a half percent. When it, when the reality is, that's like funny money. I mean, it really, I mean, it doesn't speak to what's going on. So how that gets communicated is really important. And we have talked about this, uh, you know, there, there was a, there was a visitor, Barry Bluestone, who came in and helped us evaluate some of the things we were doing in town. And, you know, one of the things that came clearly out was that it doesn't matter how good you are or how smart you are or how frugal you are, if nobody knows about it and they don't understand it, it's like it never happened. So, you know, I, I do think we have to take a concerted effort as, a, as, 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 the, as the government, you know, leaders and volunteers to try to get a, a message across of, to Chris's point, a two and a half percent increase means that we're probably going backwards a percent and a half, and it's not just in the schools. It's you know, it's in the dispatch. It's it's you know, it's in public. It's everywhere. So somehow, whoever controls the headlines down at the somebody better go down to the Chronicle and explain what that two and a half percent increase means. Don't stifle free press. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can do it. Even for the it. Yeah, praise it is, is, is service level. Is that you know we're, we're funding essentially a, a decline, a slight decline in service level. Right. That's what's going on. Any any closing comments from folks? Anything we didn't talk about? Linda. I just um, I'm reacting to the ideas about the press and, and how certain messages get out in a way that isn't necessarily the message that we want to send. And I'm wondering if our local press might be amenable to our leadership sending minutes or summaries or messages of what our meetings have come up with so that we might have a little more control over and I know don't mess with the free press, but there are also press releases um, in terms of... Letters to the editor. Sorry? Letters to the editor. Okay. So, however, to, to make a concerted effort to get the message out in our own way, in our own voices. Yeah, I think letters to the editor is a great idea. We have done that on a couple of occasions, like that, specifically, um, as related to one of the issues of the last election. The information wasn't clear. We actually wrote letters to the editor. I think we're good. It's 917. Thank you guys Most for coming. <laughs>